Matthew Hoey playing Abzan mid-range. And Hoey, his accomplishments, well, they are vast, and we're going to see him do battle here this weekend. And Hoey's list not really mucking around with a lot of ones and two ofs of various cards. Pretty decisive list, a lot of threes and four ofs. Well, if I were to start with the Temple of Malady, we'll see what he has on his second turn of the game. It's Hoey with a Sansep Citadel, so Matthew making it known exactly what he's up to, as has Belafoto now with the Island and the copy of Sylvan Carry added. So underway here in what looks to be probably a pretty lengthy green mirror. I would imagine so. Now, what's interesting about uh, Belafoto's build of this deck is that this is not any sort of whip of airbow strategy. All of the graveyard synergies that are going on here are to facilitate dig through time and treasure cruise. Goes all the way to the top of the curve with things like Doomway Giant, one copy of Pearl Lake Ancient. So this is much closer to an Esper control list that happens to be playing green than white than any of the Sultai mid-range or whip of airbow strategies we've seen up until this point. And this is a style of deck that Michael likes to play quite a bit. He's an Ohio guy, of course, I'm from the area, so I see him in a lot of PTQs. He does have a Grand Prix Top 8 to his name as well. Back in 2006 at the Flash Grand Prix, he was one of the brave souls playing Suicide Black that weekend who uh, Top 8 A reasonable Bene game choice if you weren't that concerned with winning. Well, <laughs> you would have just played Flash instead. But, yes. it, you know. Well, he, he won quite a bit. Oh, yeah, so of course. his credit. Other people won with other decks. People played Goblins, you know. They sure did. Goblins. What are you trying to say? Goblins in that field. People played Goblins Runner and up. won. Runner-up in the I tournament. Know. A Siege Rhino does come down here for Hoey. Of course, very powerful card. Puts Matthew up to 22. Belafato down to 17. Belafato's going to sacrifice Blue Delta. Go down to 16, and we'll see what he's got for this turn. I believe in the hands of the great Owen Turnwall. That's correct. Second taken. place. Perhaps his greatest magic accomplishment, coming in second with Goblins in that field. That is incomprehensible to me. Okay. Takeaway player of the year. Take away his Pro Tour top eight. Take away all of that stuff. Second at Grand Prix Flash with Goblin Lackey and friends. That is incredible. Let's see what Belafato has here. It's not a Goblin, but it's still pretty good. It's Prognostic Sphinx, and five toughness is a big deal here. Prognostic Sphinx is all sorts of good against Obzon decks. It's pretty hard for them to punch through without Obzon Charm. It's good at attacking Planeswalkers. Can't kill it, obviously, with spot removal spells. And the first thing I always check here, when I see a Prognostic Sphinx against a Siege Rhino, I always look to see, okay, does he have Obzon Charm in his deck? The answer is yes, oh, he does. He's got three copies of the card. We'll see if he has one in his hand as he deploys a course or to start things off. Thoughts he's at the top card. Let's play Caves, trigger the Courser. Gain a little bit of life here. The follow-up, it looks like he's going to take a point of damage, is a copy of Bile Blight. Going to take care of his carry added and the other two that are on that side of the table. Creative play, but one looks like it should be pretty good right now. Yeah, that was not a shabby play. Though, if I was if I was Matty Holy, my first order of business was just attack with Siege Rhino. Yeah. There's a reasonable chance Michael doesn't block there. Out of respect for Obzon Charm. And also now, because he's going to see the top card of your deck the entire time, he's going to know if you have Obzon Charm. Because if you weren't attacking last turn, that means you don't have Obzon Charm. So now he's going to see every card that you draw, so he's going to know that, okay, well, you don't have Obzon Charm until you actually do have it. Right, because, you know, it's... If he has Obzon Charm there and Michael blocks, it's so much better to Obzon Charm and Bile Blight that turn instead of Corsair and Bile Blight that Michael now knows. And the cost of the attack is essentially nothing. It's a, it's a minor information leak there by Hoey, I think. Thoughtseize is what he's going to draw. Top card from Corsair is a copy of Land of War Waste. That'll come into play. Trigger the Corsair, of course, up to 22. Now, that said, the Bile Blight play from, from Matthew was still creative and very good here as yes. he's pinning Michael on amount of mana while Matthew's ahead on board and also colored mana as well as Michael has two islands. Pretty clearly leaning on those Karyatids to give him the sufficient colored mana to function. Oh, he thought about leading off with the Thoughtseize, but he's going to attack first, so he'll come across here for six points of damage. Now he'll play the Thoughtseize that he drew. See if we get a look at Belafato's hand, and we will. Doomway Giant, Heroes Downfall, Salty Charm, Heroes Downfall, and Heroes Downfall. So three of the versatile rule spell, one Salty Charm and a Doomway Giant, but none of those spells are currently castable. No, and that's part of the reason that Hoey went for that Bile Blight play was he saw the lands that Michael was on, and it's pretty likely Michael has a handful of uncastable stuff, either with quantity of mana or colored mana, and you see both things going on right now. So we'll see a card who he wants to select in this situation. Tough to take a hero's downfall here when your opponent has three of them. Sultai Charm doesn't seem all that appealing. And then Doomway Giant, well, we're pretty far away as away from that one. I, th I still feel like hero's downfall is probably the take. It's not great, but if the Sultai Charm is not appealing and the Doomway Giant is nonsense with Utter End on the top of, of Matthew's deck, so whatever. Oh, Siege Rhino's going to come down. A little drain, a little gain. Looks like Hoey's going to push himself to 20. Belafato's down to seven. And it's a passing of the turn. Prognostic Sphinx attacked last turn. We'll see if it still, can, still continues, excuse me, to go on offense on this turn. 
There's an Opulent Palace. Yeah, I mean, Michael had to scry last turn in an attempt to find mana that he needs. Utterend's going to go after Prognostic Sphinx, I imagine. Discard here. That'll tap it, but the coast is clear to make this attack. And given that Hoey knows Belafato's hand, it's lights out, man. Hoey's going to win game number one here over Michael Belafato. Ob's on mid-range up a game here over Soltai Controls. We turn our attention to the sideboards, and we will start with Belafato and his creative Soltai Control deck. What's he got over there? A Garrick, Apex Predator, two copies of Disdainful Stroke, two Thought Seize, two copies of an Unravel the Aether, two Negate, a Silence the Believers, two copies of Vile Blight, a Drowned Sorrow, two copies of Back to Nature. Not a lot that I'm thrilled with here. I think the Thought Seizes are fine, the Disdainful Strokes are good, the one copy of Silence the Believers is good, and the one copy of Garrick. I think those are all fine cards to bring in. Other side of things, Hoey's got two main deck and offensive of the foremost, and he's got two more in his sideboard, so he can warp to four of those if he'd like. He's got a Dune Blast and then Hostilities and Obzon Charm, fourth Obzon Charm being in the board, three in the main deck, two Nissa World Wakers, and a race of Liliana Vest, two Drown and Sorrows, a Vile Blight, two Read the Bones, and Nutter End. But what you find here is what you typically find with Obzon Midrange. A deck that hedges a lot game number one, and they can sideboard appropriately in a specific matchup for games number two and three. And that's what he's got the ability to do here with cards like Read the Bones and Nissa. I think that he just wants to become a card advantage deck, and the cards you just mentioned, I think, are excellent to that end. The Nissas and the two copies of Read the Bones. I think the Liliana Vest is also fine and the Obzon Charm to that end. I, I don't like going to more copies of Anaphens at the foremost because Michael's deck is probably flush with just random removal spells to take care of that kind of stuff. I want to focus a lot more on card advantage, planeswalkers, a couple removal spells, and have that be the core game plan. I think that this matchup gets really tough for Belafonte after sideboard again because Hoey just has the ability, and this feels like Jund from years past, where you know you're hedging a lot game one, but then the stuff he gets to bring in and the stuff he gets to take out, he gets to take out some pretty bad cards and bring in some really nasty ones. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just having access to four obs on charms and read the bones is already pretty bad for Michael, who's trying to do a lot of one for one trading with this deck. On top of that, threats like Nissa, if they resolve, are really problematic. Well, these players will shuffle up here for game number two. We will talk about Patrick Chapin's fantastic book, Next Level Magic. It has been remastered for 2015. Yeah, exciting updates, new examples, new cards being described. Uh, also available on in paperback for the first time and approximately here. Also available as an ebook if you're more interested in that. StarCityGames.com slash NLM. You can order your copy today. It's like a remastered CD. You know, you yeah. change it up, you put some of those remixes on there that didn't make the original one. It's perfect. It's updated with new images and new stuff. Yeah, my, my ideal remastering is the, the Biggie Smalls album that cuts out all of Puff Daddy's mumbling over all the tracks. That would be my first choice for a remaster. Oh, so you don't like Puff Daddy? I don't like him mumbling all over Biggie's tracks. Oh, well, he can't stop. And I know he, he can't. And, I, and, and he won't stop. I know he can't stop. Would you, would you like me to stop? I would like you and Puff Daddy to oh, stop mumbling okay. over... Biggie's tracks. We should make a CD. Yep. And I can mumble on your tracks. Yeah, that'd be great. How does that sound? I would. It would breed a lot of resentment. Okay. We'll talk to. I would pursue a deal with another record label. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. So you do. And you I know that Patrick me. Chapin is already a a music mogul on top of his million other pursuits. That's correct. So I have someone I could go to. Look, you gotta leave Puffy alone, man. He's just doing his thing. Or is it Diddy or P. Diddy or it's, Sean? Or, yeah, I'm not mean, entirely sure. What is it acceptable to say you only get to have one name? Why do you just get to keep having names? Uh, I don't know. I think it's fine. People have a lot of nicknames. It's, I, I much more, I'm much more annoyed with the ruining of the art that mumbling over someone's tracks represents okay. than someone calling themselves seven different names. I, 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 I think it's offensive to just decide that you can keep switching your nickname. Sure. It's not, I mean, it's, it's not great, but whatever. Once you're that rich and successful, you're enabled by a million loons and sycophants, and you just you're just going to end up want. doing things like giving yourself a dozen nicknames. It's, it's okay. Like, who greenlit Diddy? That's not even a good name. It doesn't matter, because he's surrounded by people who are like, that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that, that's how that sort of thing it's happened. It's like the show Entourage. Yeah. That's his life. Right. I'll swap to start things off here for Belafato. Hoey will draw. Temple of Silence, take a look at the top card. It has become the bottom card. We'll head back Belafato's way. If I ever get really successful, you're going to be stunned with the things that I start doing. <laughs> like adding cream to your coffee? You're going to be, you're going to be stunned <laughs> with how enabled I am. <laughs> it's a forest. He's got all three. But that doesn't mean his hand is turned on. A card like Hero's Downfall is something he cannot cast right now. Hoey's going to sacrifice his windswept teeth. Yeah, these decks are taxed. I mean, we saw that same thing going on with Ken Ketter's deck as well, needing double green, 
and four different colors, double white for Sol Theros. It's, it's tough to cast everything. Uh, for the record, if I ever do become uh, laughably rich like Mr. Mr. Combs, mm -hmm. the first thing that I will be doing is playing a real-life edition of Carmen Sandiego. Oh, that's great. I'm just going to hide, I'm going to call you, and then you come find me. Yeah, that's actually awesome. There you go. That's, that's, one of, that's a lifelong goal of mine. Sultai Charm will be a little draw to discard one mode here. Catalog, as it were. And I think this might have been one of the reasons that Hoey led with Anafenza as opposed to some other threat was he knows the castable answer in Michael's hand right now is Sultai Charm, and Sultai Charm can't touch Anafenza. So much better to start here than, let's say, with Corsair Crufix, when you know that Michael's mana only allows him to cast a certain portion of his reactive cards. And you saw Sultai Charm in the first game. Yeah. You don't know how many are in the deck, of course, but you at least saw one, and if you can play around it accordingly, you might as well do so, and that's exactly what he did by casting Anafenza. You saw Belafato discard Drown in Sorrow, to Saltite Charm. He'll play a Polluted Delta. That'll give him a second black source of mana if necessary. And just a passing of the turn. So we're going to go back Hoey's way. Hoey will draw a card. It's a copy of End Hostilities. Not a card I expect to see in his deck after Cyborg, actually. A little Poss surprising. Possible he's worried enough about prognostics things, or he just thinks that Michael's deck is more creature-oriented than it actually is. He saw Carry Added. He saw prognostics things. He doesn't know that his deck is as controlling as it actually is. Like if I was going to go down to 15, sacrificing the polluted delta, there's a swamp. He's drawn so many basics this game, but you know when you're a three-color deck, you need those non-basics to really tie the room together. Opulent palace and temples. You know, fetch lands are nice, but there's Hero's Downfall to take care of that. And scry lands are just so important in a general sense that you know you'd really like to have those. Well, if I will draw. Two mana, Sylvan Carry added. There's a temple. That'll help things out a little bit. Top card's gonna become the bottom one here. And perhaps a passing of the turn, and it will be. Are we gonna play a copy of Windswept? He's sacrificed immediately. He's down to 17. See what land he wants to search up. He'll get a forest. And we'll see what he wants to deploy here now that he has four mana. And now we'll see how much does Matthew respect the possibility of this Daneful Stroke. Does he try to play under it for a while? <laughs> Looks like he's just going to go with Corsair, so perhaps the answer is yes here. Depends on what his hand allows him to do. But Corsair is going to resolve. Oh, he's already played a land for the turn and wins up so the plane that's on top of his deck will be his draw next turn no matter what. Melifato one tap. Five lands and a Sylvan Carry added in play. So access to six mana if he does draw a card. It's not a miracle. <laughs> but it's good to be in practice as right. here is a Courser. Top card is a Cruise. There's a Delta trigger the Courser, so long as he does remember. That's on him to make sure he gains that life. Now, if, if, if Hoey goes on to lose this game, I think now seeing Treasure Cruise, he's going to get away from this sweeper plan a little bit because the card advantage game, it really favors Michael, and Matthew's going to have to be the aggressor. Hoey will draw the plane. Stop card is a copy of Temple of Malady. Looks like we might be in Hoey's draw step here. And now we're moving into what looks like main phase one. So Hoey will take the Temple. He'll put that into play. Trigger the course. So again, a little bit of life here. Go up to 18. And now some scry action. Top card's land over waste. It's going to become the bottom one. So now we'll see the next card. And this is a Sansa of Citadel. So more lands here for Matthew. But the big problem here is that he has not one, but two copies of the hostilities in hand, and they are not great in this matchup. He's going to need Michael to play more to the board, and the problem is that if that happens, that, that opens up Michael to have a very efficient treasure cruise. Yeah. So Matthew getting kind of squeezed from both directions right now. Siege round is going to come down. Looks like it's going to resolve. So Hoey's going to gain a little bit of life. Belafato's going to lose some and pass the turn back. Belafato going to sacrifice his blue delta. So happy letting Whoa. treasure cruise go. A little surprising there, perhaps. I think that he may have... It, the only thing that I can imagine is he has another one of his card drawers already. Dig Through Time, perhaps, yeah. something like that. Okay, th that would explain it. And that does explain it. There is Dig Through Time. And I think he's got another copy of either Dig or Cruise in hand, so... So Thoughts, he's among the cards. He did have to reveal that one, thanks to course. He doesn't have to reveal the other ones just yet. So, of course, Belafato will get to take a look at the top seven and take two with him before moving on to his next turn. 
And I think Ho is probably looking at his hand as sweeper, saying, this is not the fight that I expected to have. And if game three rolls around, I'm going to make some adjustments. Yeah, perhaps he was expecting to play against something like Saltite Reanimator or the deck that Fabiano and Duke played the Players' Championship, that Saltite Constellation build, where Hostility is actually good against both of those strategies, but very poor against this deck that Belafato is playing. Or just some sort of, you know, Prognostic Sphinx, Ashiok, Kiora, mid-range kind of deck, you know, where the sweeper playing can overpower that sort of stuff. I think Matthew would not have guessed that Michael's list is what he's really playing against. Temple of Mystery was the draw for the turn. It's going to come into play. Trigger the Courser with a little bit of life gain. And it looks like, given that Bellafoto's not even reaching for his deck, he is happy with the top card of his deck in Thoughtseize. To Michael's credit, if he does draw and cast Thoughtseize next turn, he's going to get to pick up some information on what, Be on what excuse me, Hoey has done for his deck in sideboarding. For sure, and, and Hoey's been solid on lands here. Still has a full grip of cards, so the information is really valuable as well. Courser going to trigger off the Sansep Citadel. Rhino into the red zone? Absolutely. It looks like Mr. Belafato has some sort of removal spell here, or perhaps a Pearl Lake Ancient, or a Silence the Believers with Strive, a card we don't see a ton of, but quite good in this situation, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I really like the one copy of Silence of the Believers in these sideboards. I think post-board in the mid-range matchups, it's, it's often just killing something and exiling it, which is already good because so many of these decks play Whip of Arapos. And it's not hard for the board to get to the spot where you're killing two, sometimes three things. A great use of one sideboard slot. Silence was such a big card at Pro Tour Journey into Nix, especially for Chapin when he did win that tournament. We don't see that card very much, but I think it's a card that, you know, if we stay in this mid-range control world that we're in, we could see one, two, maybe even three of that card show up in 75s. It, it's very good, especially when you get to strive it just once. Definitely. I, I, I think that, you know, would you be better served with one copy of this in one under end versus two under ends in some of these lists? And the answer could be yes. Well, Hoey's hand here, it's kind of a disaster. And Hostility's Dune Blast under end, along with the Plains and a Corsair of Crucifix, not very impressive at all. Not very good. Low in power. And the information here, of course, insane for Michael, given that Matthew's hand has so many sweepers. Fortunately for Hoey, he's one game number one, because I would be surprised if he wins this one, given the texture of his hand. He'll get to really change up how he's sideboarded for game number three, now that he's working with a, a lot different information. Right. I mean, I, I can't imagine Matthew was anticipating Michael's list being this controlling in game two. Oh, we're going to draw a card, another copy of Utter End. He's all reactive at this point, and Belafato's going to get proactive with the dig through time. And the fact that, that Michael took the Courser out of that hand last turn and said one of the sweepers is, is Michael saying, I, I'm not trying to kill you with creatures at all. Game one was sort of a sort of deceptive the way that that played out. That's not really my next core strategy. Now, Belafato, the, the thing he's got to do now, you know, Dig Through Time, of course, is a very powerful card. He seemed looking at two cores of crew fix among the other options, but he, now he's just got to work his way through those removal spells. Because yeah, he doesn't have, you know, uh, some sort of like hexproof or indestructible threat, really. You know, Prognostic Sphinx kind of fulfills that role, but Doom Blast would be able to take care of that. So, you know, now he's just got to play some stuff and slog through it. He can slog through it. He does have one copy of Pearl Lake Ancient, which is pretty good for slogging through. If he bored in his one copy of, of Garrick Apex Predator, that's an easy way to win through the sweepers. But yep. you are correct. It's going to take some time for him to battle through all the sweepers that Matthew has. And Matthew has not one, but two copies of Utterrand. Not, not only one, but, you know, he's got to he's just got to get through all of that rubbish, does Belafato. You know, fortunately for him, I mean, he's a 12. He's got a good hand. Hobbs on Charm, not a bad draw there for Hoey. I think Matthew's got to draw a bunch of draw twos to get back into this one. Read the bones among them. But Hobbs on Charm will do just fine. So two cards coming at the cost of two life. He's got plenty of life to play, but there's another draw two. See if he wants to fire at that now or wait. You know, again, that's what makes this Obson deck so scary, is that it can actually keep up on cards with you. Yeah, even though Michael's the blue deck, yeah. and Michael's deck is much better at drawing cards. I mean, Dig Through Time and, and Treasure Cruise are much better than Read the Bones and Obson Charm, but Matthew's not at a huge deficit in terms of the, the raw card count game. Temple of Silence scries the top card to the bottom. It looks like it might be time to peel two more. Most likely digging for Thoughtseize if he's doing this on the main phase. So here comes two cards, Elspeth and Corsair. That's what the doctor ordered. Those are two real cards. Has to turn back over to Belafato. Belafato with his seven mana will draw a card. Let's see what Michael can put together on this turn. 
He's already reaching for mana, so he must have found something he likes. Five mana. There's a Sphinx. And again, a fine card, but the, again, it's just another card that's going to die as we make our way through Matthew's answers. But it's at least Matthew's whole turn, or at least most of his turn. Well, you mentioned Thoughtseize being a big draw. Well, there that is. Yeah. Now, again, how does he want to lead off here is the big question. Does he actually want to lead off with Thoughtseize in this situation to make sure he can cast on Hostility? So it looks like the answer is yes. I think the information is too valuable here. He's got to just know what's going on. And an interesting hand, to be sure. Pearl like Ancient, a Disdainful Stroke, a Doomway Giant, and a Thoughtseize on Belafato's side. Yeah, the stateful stroke being up, you know, that's what that two mana up front there. It felt like that's what it signified. And Hoy was able to sniff that out and actually make sure with Thoughtseize. Though the question is interesting on if you're supposed to take the stateful stroke to clear the path for a big spell, or if you're just supposed to say, hey, give me that pearl like ancient. That one's probably pretty important. I can see arguments for, in fact, all the cards that are in Michael's hand. Probably not the Thoughtseize, but because one of Matthew's big payoff cards in hand is Elspeth, he even has to be concerned to some degree with Doomwave Giant. But Matthew now on the back of these back-to-back -back Obzon charms and the Thoughtseize is really, he's caught up in terms of the card count. He's got a lot of power in his hand to work with. The sweepers are going to be pretty potent given how creature-heavy Michael's hand is. He's got a shot in this game, and it was looking pretty bleak two turns ago. Well, decisions, decisions. Oh, he's certainly going to take his time. Number 20 on our season one at leaderboard here for 2015. Did come into this tournament with a bye. We've seen them have a lot of success on the Open Series circuit, mostly in Legacy with Stoneforge Mystic, but no slouch in Standard either. He's got a real choice to make here. Not in a bad spot anymore, thanks to those Obzon charms. You said it, draw, those draw two is very important for him. And keep in mind that Michael has a lot of information about Matthew's hand and how super heavy it is, so that's part of the complexity here is any card that Matthew takes here informs Michael about what Matthew's plan is for the game. So this is a super complicated thought seize, especially because all the cards in Michael's hand are of approximately even worth. They're all, there's a case for all of them. He's gonna go with the stroke. And I think the decision there for Hoey, wouldn't surprise me if he's thinking about, can I beat Pearling Ancient? Yep. He's gonna tap a bunch of mana right now, and he's actually gonna go with Elspeth. You saw Belafato reaching for his prognostic things, expecting for it to die, but that is not the case, so does not elect to cast in hostilities or Dune Blast in this situation. Well, now that the Disample Stroke is out of the way, he can say, all right, go ahead. Do you add something to your board? Okay, now I sweep away everything. Do you attack my Elspeth? Okay, I play a Sweeper. I plus my Elspeth. I have your Pearl Lake Ancient covered for the time being. Belafato going to cast Thoughtseize, so... He wants to get a better idea of, okay, what's going on on your side of the table? You see a Doom Blast, and Hostility is a Corsair of Crufix, and Utter End is what Hoey's working with. So some options to choose from here as well. Difficult thoughts is for both players. Oh, yeah, especially because they're working with so much information on both sides. I mean, everything is a tip of the hat in terms of information and what your game plan is. It's interesting, too, because whatever you take gives away a little bit of information of probably for what you're trying to set up. Yeah, exactly. Well, Doom Blast's going to bite the dust. And now here comes the Sphinx, and it's always dangerous to let that thing attack because of the trigger. Get the scry three times. Corsair of Crufix among the cards, and also a Temple of Mystery hiding out there. The third card is not being the palace. So if you're Hoey, and of course you don't know this, yeah, not the worst place in the world to be, not the, not the best three cards that Belafato got to look at there. Still, you just don't want the Sphinx going unchecked for, for that long, you know? Hero's downfall going to take care of us. By the time he topped it there from Belafato, he did not have that when the turn started. Yeah, that's a huge deal because now Hoey's in a position where he has to use a sweeper to answer this prognostic Sphinx most likely. And then it starts freeing a Pearl Lake Agent, Doomwave Giant, you know, other significant cards in Michael's hand. Hoey's draw was a copy of Thoughts. He's big draw there for him. Yep. It means now that he at least can get out of the Pearl Lake Ancient, which is the biggest long-term threat that Michael's signifying right now. Looks like Koei may lead off with Corsair, and he will. So refusing to cast in hostilities at this point. Take a look at the top card. It's a copy of Soren, Solemn Visitor. Not bad. 
Well, he may feel like right now he's in a position to win this damage race straight up. There's Thoughtseize. And if Michael commits more to the board, then the sweeper becomes very good. Yeah, it looks like he wants to race. He's going to take Doomwake Giant, which can't kill the tokens now because it's gone. Pearl of is the last card in Belafato's hand. And we could see Utter End be used just as a... Uh, kind of just put him in the squeeze, honestly. Exactly. Just trade your whole turn. And Michael, you know, he goes ahead and uh, deploys the Pearl Lake Agent. Then he, if he returns Lance to his hand, it's a long time before that Pearl Lake comes back. Yeah, I like this play a lot here because it forces Belafato's hand in a very weird way. Are you going to discard right now? to keep around Access Sphinx, which, by the way, will be tapped, mind you. So that's going to be tapped now. So no attack, no scry, no nothing. Belfast is going to draw a card. I believe he knows what card is coming. It's a Courser. So he gets to cast that, take a look at the top card, trigger his Temple. He knew that was there. So now we get to see this card. Of course, he gains Life Temple. Now he's going to go to the bottom. So now that's going to go to the bottom, take a look at the top card to dig through time, which is very powerful, but we don't know if he's going to have time to make it there. And that's the powerful thing in this spot for, for Matthew is with the end hostilities in hand, he always has the option of just stopping what's ever happening on the board and resetting. He's not necessarily the best to play that game against Michael because of all Michael's powerful card drawing spells, but at least he has an out in case the board develops in a way that's bad for Hoey. Well, I think he's got a, f I think I've got a feeling at least that he likes the way the board is developing right now. Going to have the opportunity to add Soren to it in just a moment if he'd like. First things first though, Temple, trigger, up to 10. Good card on top of the deck there, and then Liana. Powerful in the abstract, but is it what he's looking for right now? It might be, because a, a path that, that Hoey has right now is playing Sorin, plusing Sorin, hitting for a bunch of damage, untapping, and using Liliana to tutor for Siege Rhino or another Sorin. So we can, he can actually try to burn Michael out of the game at this point. Uh, the old Obzon burn you out strategy. There's nothing this deck can't do. Soren's going to come in. Hoey considering ticking it up. Of course, he just started four, though. Maybe perhaps having a flying 2-2 Black Vampire is where he wants to be. But instead, bringing it in the red zone here. And, and what might be the most overlooked part of this is that he's going to gain a whole bunch of life in this exchange. Yeah, he got, he's got a big cushion. He still has a sweeper in hand. And he's going to have an opportunity to uh, tutor for a lethal Siege Rhino off of the Liliana next turn. So a lot of good stuff going on for Hoey this turn. I like the way that he's navigated this game. Some damage will happen. Some damage will be dealt. Belafato's down to two. Hoey, of course, gains a bunch of life there. Dig through time to draw here for Belafato. Top card is a Garrick Apex Predator. <laughs> How does that change things? Well, it might be a little late to the party. One. Yeah, I think even with a full discount and a land drop. A full discount on the dig through time and a land drop. He's short this turn. It is exciting, however. Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, Garrick does cost seven. So if he wants oh, to play... Oh, okay, yeah, yes. Okay. If, if he, I mean, this, but this would force his dig through time to be Garrick plus, plus land. land. And I don't know if Garrick plus land is what he wants to do. You know, that's the bigger question at this point. I mean, it's Garrick. It's hard to pass up on that card. Though, to be fair, maybe if he finds something like Doomway Giant, then all of a sudden it's, I'll take Doomway Giant, kill your stuff, and have Garrick as my backup card? That's very solid. Yeah. And he's found two, card, two cards, excuse me, that he likes. Because his attackers allow him to clean up Soren. So he can get out of that, assuming that he can clean up the board. Dissolve the top card here. Let's also not forget, too, that if it is Garrick plus land, he gets to gain a life. Yeah, he gets to gain a life. Go up to three, which is a big deal. And he's tapping seven mana, so we know what this is going to be. It's the Apex Predator. Now, a lot of text on this card. Destroy target Planeswalker is one. So Destroy a target more creature, life you gain life equal to his toughness, so kill your courser, gain four life is a big deal. Of course, he can make a 3-3 black beast creature token. We'll have to check to see if we have those with us. Be a little surprised if we do. With Death Touch on the battlefield, and then, well, we'll talk about the emblem if we get there. And the dissolve on top of Michael's deck is a big deal, too, because, you know, Hoey's line of play here of using Liliana to uh, search for Siege Rhino no longer works. Yep. This game has gone through a couple of swings, my friends. Soren looks like it's going to take up. He's coming in the red zone, going after Garrick, which he will get to kill. 
yeah, which is a, a big deal. A big deal, and it also means that Michael's creatures on the way back cannot kill the Soren. Yep. So this is a pretty solid Constellation Prize here for Hoey. And he might be happy resetting. Yeah, he is. This is what you talked about with the reset button, always having this available if he didn't like how things were going. And given that he's working with the information of, okay, you have no board, I know you're drawing Dissolve, I can play around this appropriately, not a bad turn there. Yeah, and now he's working towards a Soren emblem, which is going to be a big problem for Michael's deck to beat because you look through this list, there's no Planeswalkers, except for the Garrick that has just died. So it's gonna, he's going to be really hard-pressed to oh, beat this. What oh, what a draw. What a draw. A little surprising he doesn't even cast the Dissolve, though. I'd rather get the Scry there. Yeah, you might as well Scry. Now Soren's going to make a Vampire token. Thoughtseize is so powerful. And now he gets to clear the path for exactly this and Liliana. You have to imagine we're going to see some tutoring here. And it could be that Burnout plan that you mentioned to go find a Siege Rhino. Yeah, because Siege Rhino next turn allows Matthew to plus. I guess he's still short of lethal if he pluses, but... Puts him in a squeeze it's still a lot of it's, it's a lot of damage. And you saw him very quickly search for something. He didn't get a great look. It may have been a Siege Rhino, but he knew exactly what he wanted to search for. Yep. This has just been a great game from Hoey. I yep. mean, it, it was looking bleak for him in a number of turns. Oppenfall is going to come down. It's going to be an extension of the hand. So Matthew Hoey is going to win this match here over Michael Belafato. Two games to zero. Abzan midrange is going to take down Sultai Control. But this is part of the appeal of Abzan midrange is when you get against these other midrange and control decks, you can just sideboard into a lean, mean, but kicking machine. Well, and and I didn't even think Matthew had the ideal setup there. He was he was really sweeper heavy, but the way the game played out, the sweepers were just good enough. I mean, there's a couple spots where Michael needs, you know, just one more attacker, one more blocker, one extra counter spell, and Matthew's entire line of play doesn't work. But uh, Matthew had just the right amount of resources.